Oh, and then the whole thing about um, speaker view versus hi, everyone. Feel free to unmute so we can chat over our I'm actually having ice water full disclosure. I already had coffee. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, so I guess the question is, Joe, do we want to switch to speaker view? I think so when we're let's do that. Okay, I mean, for now, actually right now, and I can do that right now. I'm just gonna do gallery. Hi, we're all get we're getting situated. Um, nice to see you all. Good morning. Lois is coming. Kat, nice to put a uh, put, see your face <laughs> as opposed to just a phone call. Thank you for being here. Not capitalized. Um, Lindsay and Mark. Jim Lindsay was able to take some time away from his retirement. You look like you're you do look busy. It's that bookshelf. Jim yeah, Lindsay. <laughs> Judy. <clears throat> nice to see you all. We're getting all getting situated. Um, feel free to unmute and chat or, or whatever. Um, yeah, really happy to be here on a, another dreary Saturday morning. So I'm in meetings with, you know, when I'm in my um, committee meetings, I'm with, you know, legislators from all over the state and um, Representative Brees Iverson, she's in, I think, Redmond, and there was like sunlight streaming on her. And I'm like, oh, I was so envious. I even emailed her. <laughs> um, but it's not the Arctic, the Arctic snow to East Coast, right? This is mild compared to what a lot of the country's dealing with right now. Yeah, and you're from Chicago, so. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I know. I I have a lot of family back in the Libertyville and oh. line area. And my mom just talks about, oh, it's so cold. Oh, we had to have the guy come and shovel the driveway again. And oh, it's so cold. Yeah, we're pretty fortunate. And I remember growing up like this big fear of um, um, snow caving in the roof. So you'd have to have people come shovel off your roof. I don't think it's got, I don't think there's been that much snow this year yet where that's been a concern, but yeah, my mom's 86. So we finally convinced her she shouldn't be shoveling snow since she, she hires a neighbor. <laughs> like, okay, Good. Just do it for us, mom, please. I, and I'm, and sometimes I'm like, I don't ask much of you. She's like, what now? <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> but I was like, you have to get a COVID vaccine, which she did. She did get that her first dose. Uh, because she's in Illinois. <laughs> right. Oops. Little little editorial comment there. Um, okay, so here we are. It is 1031. Uh, we're live on Facebook and we're recording this event. Thank you so much for joining um, this morning. I'm Lisa Reynolds, um, state representative from Oregon House District 36, which is uh, Portland's west side. Um, I see um, a lot of familiar faces here and some new ones too. I'm changing my, um, we'll obviously be letting people as they join or as they uh, come into our waiting room. Um, hey, Bill, nice to see you. So thank you all for being here. I'm gonna turn over the first few minutes here to my, he's here for me, uh, my ABLE um, team member, um, Joe Erickson, who's listed as Lisa Reynolds, but he is right. Joe Erickson. He must have renamed himself, but. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Rep. Reynolds. Uh, before we begin, I just want to talk about a few notes just to set up this uh, wonderful constituent coffee. Once again, thank you all for being here. It really means a lot. Um, I just want to start off with a land acknowledgement and um, just to say that uh, we are currently seated on traditional land of the Yali Tawalitsin, the Waska Galitz Clackamas, and the Kalapuya. 
Um, indigenous people have played a large role in shaping the world we live in today. So we just wanna make sure we acknowledge them before getting started. And just to give a quick little rundown, um, Rep Reynolds will go over a, a few uh, points about what's happening in the district, what's happening in the state uh, before we get to the question and answering section. Um, and uh, once again, thank you all for joining us. We really want to value this time uh, speaking with um, you guys, our neighbors, constituents, um, especially since we're not able to meet in person. And uh, this kind of constituent coffee, um, you know, it's a space to uh, ask questions and engage in policy discussions. So we welcome and passion critique. Um, all we ask is that it remains respectful uh, of each other and the representative. And if someone's behavior crosses the line from frustrated to disrespectful, uh, we may ask the individual to leave this call. Um, but thank you again. And uh, I'd like to pass it over to Representative Reynolds uh, for just uh, a quick introduction and some uh, starting talking points. Good morning. Hey, all. Really, really nice to see you. Thank you all for, for being here. Um, as I keep saying, it's really, um, really means a lot to me that you're taking some time out of your Saturday morning. Uh, even in COVID, our Saturdays are still precious. Um, and uh, I will say, I mean, Joe and I were talking earlier, and feel free to comment um, about timing for you guys, if this seems like good timing. Um, I think Saturday morning coffees are the way to go right now. I uh, plan to do one a month. So um, if, uh, if 1030 makes sense to you, let me know. If, you, if, if this is a difficult time for you, let me know. And I realize I'm asking the people who made the effort to be here, but um, a lot of you are people who come to a lot of my events. So um, I'm happy to get feedback on that. And um, so, so we have finished, I think our third week in session. <laughs> this is all, I, I know that Joe Biden finished his second full week this week. It's been two and a half weeks since Joe Biden's inauguration. I'll just, I'll just peg my success to his. Yeah, very exciting. Like what a like, like weight off our shoulders of not having to, um, you know, wake up every day wondering what, you know, he who shall not be named has, has tweeted. Um, so in any case, um, very exciting to see what's happening at the national level. In particular, one thing that came, that I read about only briefly this morning was um, the Senate passing the restaurants bill which was uh, Earl Blumenauer's brainchild. Um, and I think this is particularly important as we think about, um, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but how Oregon is able to keep our COVID numbers low and getting lower. Um, and it has been at the, literally at the expense of restaurants and bars. And so um, I'm very excited about the prospect of you know, things that are so important um, in Oregon and in Portland uh, that, that those small business owners get the relief that, they, that is long overdue. Um, I thought I should spend a minute or two talking about um, what was a pretty difficult week uh, in terms of um, the Oregon House, in terms of what happened uh, around Representative Diego Hernandez. Uh, it was pretty prominent in the news, so a lot of you have probably heard about this, and I talked about it in my newsletter that went around yesterday, but Representative Diego Hernandez, um, it's, it's clear that he engaged in a pattern of um, abusive behavior towards women um, and an abuse of power in his role as a state legislator. So um, this, uh, this came to light last spring. Um, and, uh, and there was a, what felt like a very long investigation, about a nine month investigation took place with, a, with an independent investigator wh whose report was made public um, about a, a little less than two weeks ago. And then during this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the House Conduct Committee met to um, go over that report, including having uh, the five women who were um, who contributed to the investigation, um, they either testified or had a proxy testify in their stead. And it was uh, I, I watched quite a bit of it or, and listened to some of it, and it's it was very um, very difficult to to hear and very difficult to think about what these women went through, both you know um, uh, in their relationship with Representative Hernandez, and then also having to go so public and testify with it, even though some anonymity was was preserved. Um, the um, the House Conduct Committee voted unanimously. This is a committee of four people, two Republicans, two Democrats, voted unanimously yesterday for 
um, the Oregon House to expel Representative Hernandez. That's certainly, um, you know, certainly a, uh, a decision that I wholeheartedly support, as do many of my colleagues. I don't know exactly how many. Um, my hope, and I think all of our hope, is that he resigns. And if he doesn't, it will have to come to a floor vote to expel him from the Oregon House, which as far as our House historian knows, has never happened before in the Oregon House. And, um, and so that's, that's a, it's a tough way to start my legislative career, but obviously it's, it's, it's the right thing to do. Um, no question, it's the right thing to do. But so I just wanted to share that. And if you guys have any questions on that, we can talk about that a little at the question and answer time. Um, and um, hopefully most of you got, most of you got and, and, and carefully poured over my newsletter from yesterday. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, I am on three committees. I am on the um, House Committee on Water uh, I'm on the House Committee on Behavioral Health and the House Committee on Early Childhood. I am learning a ton. Uh, I'm learning both kind of some of the, some environmental principles in the Water Committee. I'm learning the um, kind of interagency intricacies of what it means to deliver um, early childhood education um, through state agencies. That's, I think, going to take a while before. I need a Venn diagram. I need a, if anyone can help me with that, thank you. Because there's a lot of overlap. So there's, you know, you have one agency's Venn diagram, not Venn diagram, org chart. So figuring that out. And also a big part of what early childhood committees trying to do is to simplify that so that it's uh, explicable to people who are accessing the system and, and easy to get the services that they need. Um, we certainly know there's a childcare crisis all over the U.S. Oregon has been hit, you know, Oregon has, has had a childcare crisis even before COVID. That's been worsened, of course, um, in COVID because of some of the um, safety measures that have to be put in place. And um, the fact that a lot of daycares had to close down, you know, without notice uh, in March. Um, those of you who know me well know how important gun violence prevention is to me. And there are several bills kind of wending their way through the process, um, a bill that would require that guns are locked when not in use. Um, my, the bill that I'm the chief co-sponsor is the Charleston loophole, and we're working with the House Judiciary Committee to get a hearing on that. You all will be um, among the first to know. Um, it's, it's incredibly compelling to me that the um, secure storage gun bill is in the House Health Committee. This is a, you know, a tip of the hat that gun violence is a public health, um, you know, is a public health issue. And that was just such a great acknowledgement of that, that this isn't about legal wrangling. This is about um, saving lives. So public health issue. And um, so that's very exciting. Um, also, uh, Senator, our, our Senator Jenny Burdick um, is, there's a couple, um, couple different bills that are looking at how we can keep guns out of um, state buildings, at, such as the state capitol. And um, Judy for sure knows, I mean, we've been there uh, on gun violence uh, prevention days when there are, there are um, other constituents in the capitol, you know, openly carrying guns and it's, it's intimidating. And as a legislator, obviously that's intimidating as well. Um, as you guys know, I'm a, I'm a physician, so I am all about all things COVID. I, you know, think about this stuff 24 seven. So I thought I would, um, I wanted to bring up a few slides on, on where we are with COVID in Oregon and talk a little bit about the vaccine. Um, and so this is always a bit of a challenge for me. Okay, so I made a little slideshow. There's slide one. You can see very um, high production value. Hopefully I spelled everything right. Um, so he, this is Oregon. I didn't write Oregon on here, but this is Oregon. Um, this is as of this morning. This is the New York Times chart of cases in Oregon. And you guys know I've been showing this chart for, you know, since March, um, sharing this in our, although usually I was holding paper up, so see I've advanced paper up to the camera. But when I really looked at this, I really got kind of choked up. I mean, it is incredibly exciting to see the, this graph over the last three to four weeks. And this is thanks to everyone in Oregon who's been doing the right thing by wearing masks, 
staying socially distanced, foregoing social events with loved ones, um, looking at you, Judy and Paul, um, with loved ones and with friends, uh, and, um, and it works. And I, I do have to say, I, um, not to name drop, but I had a meeting with the governor this week, just a kind of getting to know you meeting. Um, and, and I thanked her for that. I mean, her, her pretty strict rules around restaurants and bars and schools um, has really contributed to Oregon being um, having among the lowest case per capita rate and the lowest death per capita rate in the country. Like we're in the we're in the lowest five or six, meaning meaning we're the best. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, you know what I mean. We have the fewest among the fewest cases per capita and fewest deaths per capita in the country. Um, it has not been without huge sacrifice. As I mentioned earlier, we all know about some of our favorite restaurants who are really, really struggling or who have shuttered their doors. And, um, you know, there's so many reasons that I am excited about Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in the White House. Uh, one is that a, a true commitment to um, uh, a robust package to help people who are businesses, including restaurants and, and states who are struggling due to COVID. So obviously we're not out of the woods, but it does, you know, this is some of the best news we've had in a really, really long time. So let's, we can celebrate a little because um, we certainly have had a lot of doom and gloom <laughs> meetings uh, in, in these uh, town hall events. And Joe, you're tracking the waiting room. Thank you, because now I lost track of that. Um, and then this is, uh, I'm really um, honored to say that I have been vaccinated. These are pictures of the vaccine. I was at the vaccine clinic and I'm like, can I take pictures? It doesn't even say COVID on it, but those are the vaccines. Like it's, it's this kind of emotional reaction when you see them. As you can see, I've had both my doses. Uh, I'm really grateful. I will be kind of fully protected in another week or so. Um, really grateful and it's, and um, as I've said over and over again, I'm working really hard to get as many Oregonians vaccinated as quickly as possible. And so this does bring us to where we are in Oregon. So um, I will say uh, that overall, um, we are, I think Oregon has improved um, greatly its ability to get people vaccinated, to get shots into arms. The, the process is tremendously bumpy. I'm hearing stories. I mean, we've heard the stories of, you know, donors to Providence getting vaccines. I've heard stories of perfectly healthy 25 year old to nanny for a family getting a vaccine because they're childcare providers. I mean, things that are, I think problematic and are hopefully still being um, paid attention to. Um, I know it was a really controversial decision on the governor's part to, um, to prioritize teachers over um, older Oregonians. Um, and we know that that comes at a price. I mean, it comes at a price of lies. And we know that because, you know, two thirds of deaths of Oregonians from COVID has been in the 65 and older age group. So that was that that is it kind of is what it is. I don't know if I have much more to say about that. Um, but uh, starting Monday, um, Oregonians who are 80 and older can start getting their COVID vaccine. Um, and each week they are lowering that um, upper age limit by five years. So a week from Monday will be 75 and older, two weeks from Monday will be 70 and older, three weeks from Monday will be 65 and older. This still feels slower than we would like it to be, but I certainly understand the graded process with the thought that maybe um, we can, it's, it's a priority, priority um, list. Could, could, so I big, a, could I yes. make a comment on that? Yes. Um, I, I appreciate the fact that the governor is doing this in a graded level, but these dates are highly misleading because people will not get vaccinated on those dates. They will be eligible to sign up for a, a date sometime in the future. And these dates are way too compact because reality is it's going to take several months. So yes. yeah. this is a, a, a um, mess that is of our own creation that doesn't need to be done that way. If they would be honest about what happens on Monday and honest about what these other dates are, they're just 
scheduling dates for the future, not for vaccinations. Right. No, thank you for that. And I, um, yes, absolutely. We are getting, uh, we are on track to get 120 some thousand vaccines a week. Again, that we don't, you know, nothing's for sure until those vaccines are in hand, or I should say in freezer, don't put it in your hand, in the freezer. Um, it, absolutely. These are just dates of when eligibility begins. It certainly doesn't guarantee you're going to get a vaccine that day or that week. Um, and believe me, I have spent a lot of time in the rabbit hole of trying to schedule vaccine for constituents who are in, I still have a, a, a dear friend who's in 1A uh, who has not received a vaccine because every time we try to schedule it, um, it's, you know, no appointments are available. And so I'm, these are the, as far as I can tell, these are the best resources. I'm doing big air quotes because when I, this morning I went into the chat bot and there are no appointments available through that first website. Um, when I called 211, I was placed on an interminable hold, but I know that they are um, increasing the number of people, including 30 National Guards, National Guards people to help answer calls through 211. Again, I'm not, it's not clear to me how many of those calls result in an appointment. Um, this is a phone number to schedule on the phone. When I called on Thursday, there are no appointments available. So, I mean, this is all absolutely grain of salt. There is a program to um, disperse vaccines to Albertsons and to Safeway. That's not up and running yet, um, but that's an effort to try to not have not to force everyone to converge on the convention center. I know there's a drive-through vaccine clinic at the airport, but for the life of me, I could not find any access to that. So yes, um, it's still very clunky. I mean, I think what I would say, and, and um, Joe, do you wanna share your mom's story if you don't mind? Yeah, yeah, so um, my mom is a um, educator and she recently, uh, today actually got the uh, vaccine at the um, convention center uh, vaccination site. And um, it was a very smooth process for her. She was in and out within a, about an hour, I think, more or less. And she thought she was going to be there for much, much longer. So on some end, you're seeing a lot of those bad stories, but I think they are certainly getting the process uh, better with each, you know, with each coming day. Yeah. So again, I <clears throat> completely share the frustration and the urgency we all need to be feeling about getting um, high priority groups vaccinated. And I will keep updating this information. I'll be updating it on social media and in my um, newsletter. I plan on doing a newsletter every two weeks, but if there is a, if there's significant um, news, I, I'm happy to send out a newsletter more often than that, especially around this, this topic. Yes. So I, that's okay. I have a couple of sure, sure, things sure. I'd like to add yet. Yeah. And thank you, Representative Reynolds. And I did send an email to your office. I'm <clears throat> new to your district. And I live Welcome. at Terwilla Group Plaza, which I guess used to be categorized as a congregant living area for seniors. We're all over 65. Many, many of us are over 90. Actually, my husband partner who's right here is your dad's age, but you don't have to call me mom. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Although you could, but um, yeah, so because of some, I found out that in-home if someone receives in-home care or is giving in-home care paid or not, that you could you would be eligible. And right. the way to get to the um, airport, which keep your fingers crossed because we have an appointment at the airport later today to receive oh. our COVID vaccines. But Great. it was a really complicated process. And because I'm really type A, I just kept checking back and checking back and checking back. And finally an appointment, you know, showed up and I grabbed it. But um there's a lot of strife here among residents and I'm on the resident council and I'm representative from my floor. And so I hear a lot from people that we, I just heard we were just reclassified as not congregate living. Everybody here who's in our, who's not independent living, which I am and of over 200 of us are, um, but the others in Metcalf and Terrace, which are continuing care, receive their vaccinations and every staff person, whether they have direct contact with people or not, receive their vaccinations. And independent living people were told 
uh, several months ago that when we would get our vaccinations with everybody else, but apparently recently we were reclassified, those of us independent, as not to be congregate living. So there's a lot wow. of confusion yeah. and a lot so that, of heartache. That, and yeah, I'm so sorry to hear that. Stress. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. That doesn't make sense. I'm such a fan of Twilliger Plaza. I want to come there one day. <laughs> I, I ended up. I also, I'll get you on a Saturday forum. You said it. I'm going to do it. So I, I love it. I would love it because I, I uh, in uh, phone banking when we had to transition to phone banking, I talked to a lot of folks who live there. So thank you, Alice. And I know there was an article in New York Times about um, how people are, uh, especially children of people who are in the older age group, it's like a part-time job trying to find a vaccine appointment. My parents are in Illinois. Uh, my dad's a veteran, so he got it through the VA. So I was really grateful for that. Um, Jim, you have your hand up? No, yeah. what's clear for um, an 80 year old friend of mine, can he just simply show up at the convention center on Monday or uh, it, does the convention center need appointments and everything else? I didn't know. I would say the convention center needs appointments, but I absolutely, but I, you know, oh. I'm, I, you didn't hear it here, but I mean, I don't, I have a hard time thinking they would turn him away. Maybe Tuesday or Wednesday. I don't know. You know, seriously, if it were my parent and I couldn't get um, an appointment, I might just show up with them. Oh, I see. But, it, but the general idea is that everybody, the goal is that everybody that shows up at the convention center already has an appointment. Yes. Yes. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay. yes. Is the army coming to Oregon also to, uh, to uh, give shots? Last I heard it was just National Guard, but I, I could be wrong about that. Okay, I saw last night on the TV that active uh, uh, active duty troops are-, are Wow. Being, but I don't know, they didn't say where they're going, so. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. That's, yeah, I hadn't heard that yet. I'll, yeah. I'll just say that Oregon doesn't need more people to give shots. Right, I, I will say I'm trying to volunteer and it's like there's, no slots available to volunteer to give shots. I think we do have a, a pretty um, pretty big volunteer workforce and the hospitals are sending their paid staff in too. But, um, but if, if it means that we could have more sites, I think that would be great. Obviously there's been a huge focus on the convention center and the airport, but you know, we need something in, in you know, far out East Portland, we need, um, you know, around the state, I think we're doing okay with some of the local health departments, but I think, you know, having more sites would, would probably involve more people and more logistics. So thank you. Um, hey, I want, and, and I'm happy to talk about this further. Is there anyone else? I can't tell. Oh, does Jim still have his hand up? <laughs> Again? No, I'm, I'm teasing you. I'm teasing you, Jim. I can tease Jim. Um, there I, we go. <laughs> Um, any other any other burning questions on COVID vaccine? I wish I had more um, definitive information. I wish I had the magic door, um, but I will I will do all I can to keep people updated. I get briefed uh, by the Oregon Health Authority. There's one on Monday. In fact, I think maybe I'll wait and send out um, information to everyone who's on this till after that call on Monday uh, and update things on social media. Um, Rep. Reynolds, we do have a, a, a question from the chat, um, which was uh, asking, Judith asked, what's your take on the new CDC director's statement about the data showing low risk for opening in-person school? Oh my gosh, you're opening up a whole can of worms. Yeah, um, no, I'm, I'm, leave it to Judy. <laughs> Um, so school, you know, I have to say the whole, it's, it is really, really complicated. And I'm learning uh, in the legislature that things are, um, I think we all know it's complicated. And then when I get in the legislature, I realize they're even more complicated. Uh, as you guys know, I've been calling pretty heartily out for schools to reopen as I see in my exam room, how um, young people are really struggling with distance learning. I'm seeing a widening achievement gap. I'm seeing increased mental health issues that for some kids would be, um, would be improved by going back to school, not all kids. So I've been calling for schools to reopen. Um, and I think that um, the governor's decision to vaccinate teachers to help them feel more comfortable being in the classroom was a... Um, was, was interesting and I think has some merit to it. I agree that it wasn't necessary to reopen schools, but if it helps um, those people who are taking care of our kids uh, feel safer and more comfortable, as it should, it does make you safer, um, then 
you know, so be it right now. But even though the CDC is saying that wasn't necessary, I think Oregon was not on track to reopen schools uh, anyway. And I think that actually, because of how we think about things here in Oregon, vaccinating teachers had a lot, has allowed us to have some concrete plans for reopening. That said, those reopening plans are, are literally all over the map. Um, and I'm, you know, talking, I, I see patients on Fridays. I'm like, so which district are you and what are they doing? Uh, most districts have plans to open in April to like K through third grade with the thought of adding in fourth and fifth grade. I think most school districts, at least in the Portland metro area, are not planning on opening middle or high school until the fall. Um, and I think there's pros and cons to all of this. The, you know, the older the kids are, the more likely they will spread COVID amongst themselves. We worry about children catching COVID in the classroom and bringing it home if there's high risk people in the home. And that's for any kid, not just the older kids. So that's where things are right now. Um, what I'm really hoping for is perhaps what, um, there's been some discussion about a fifth quarter, maybe opening schools in the summer for everyone. I don't think this ha should be a remedial summer school program. Um, I think we have to think really um, smartly about how we look at school in the fall, that we're not just picking up at the next grade. Um, I think we maybe even have to think of, for some kids, this is going to be a K through 13 um, educational career um, so that we can really uh, do what we can to make sure we keep our um, we keep increasing our graduation rate. We just, uh, Oregon just announced its highest high school graduation rate, which is kind of interesting. While schools were closed in 2020 is 82%. Yes, that's the highest it's been in, in recent history, uh, which is still way too low for me. Um, and, um, and so, uh, so um, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but um, I'm, I'm heartened to see some schools reopening. I, appreciate that that there's still a lot of risk. I understand that there are families who will still decide to keep their kids home. I've, I've heard from families that are gonna keep their kids home because of risk factors in the family. I had a family yesterday who said, you know, we're doing okay at home, so we're gonna stay at home. And that just debulks that classroom for the kids who truly need to be there. And I, I thought that was really kind of a cool thing too. So we're on our way for the earliest grades. And I think having a really important discussion about summer school and how we look at the fall, how we think about achievement and catching kids up. Um, well, the Association of Teachers seems to have a uh, reluctant to open schools. Do you have any insight on that? I do not. I don't. I, um, I'm pretty much just reading what you're reading in the paper and I'm hearing what Portland Public Schools plan is and I don't know, you know, the fric what the friction, how strong the friction there is. Um, I, I will say I agree with the Oregonian editorial last week if, uh, if vaccinated teachers um, don't go back into the classroom that's that's pretty pretty problematic very problematic to me. We made a we made a we made a decision as a state to prioritize teachers in an effort to get back to school, and I mean, that's a little bit of a um, an understanding of why teachers got vaccinated. So that, that's important to me. Um, I was going to ask Kate Sheriff. Kate, you're here, right? I saw you at some point. To um, I'm going to stop screen sharing. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Um, Love the artwork. So oh, yeah. a lot, I know a lot of you know, Kate, we have a lot of overlapping um, groups of friends and activists. Um, but I'm just going to have Kate tell her story of something that's going on in the district. Sure. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so Lisa, um, I, I know many of you through my work with Indivisible Oregon and Stand on Every Corner PDX and activism around impeachment and protecting our democracy and standing up for immigrants and vulnerable communities, but I'm actually here today to talk about a different issue, which is um, kind of semi-related, but in a different part of my life, which is, um, you can kind of see my kids' artwork up here. I have a um, seven and a half year old daughter who drew this little person planet with the earth core and a four and a half year old son who do the solar system. That's all those funny dots and the rainbow. So they're not, they're not in the camera, but many of you know my kids, Henry and Esther. Um, Esther goes to a school that's um, in Lisa's district in the South Waterfront area called the Cottonwood School, and Henry will be a kindergartner there next year. And um, 
some of you may have seen in the news recently that there's concerns right now about um, the exposure at our school to the chemical weapons that ICE has been using because our school is directly adjacent to the ICE building in the South Waterfront. And as I'm sure um, most of us are aware, there have been many, many protests at the ICE building, including very recently after the inauguration. Um, and um, oh, sorry, yeah, I just there. thought I'd show the map of this is where the school is and this is where the ICE building is. Yeah, and right next to South door. Waterfront, which you guys. Yeah. And, and that's where Tesla is. But anyway. Yeah, we're yeah. right by Tesla and school. <laughs> yeah, nice building. Um, and so um, you know, this the use of tear gas and chemical munitions by ICE has and federal agents has been going on for since this summer. Um, but um we really, you know, I'm I, along with other parents and the school administration, have been very busy dealing with child care and distance learning and all of those other things. And um, we really uh, started to think about this and raise the alarm about this issue more in the past couple of weeks, because we are thinking about, you know, as Lisa was saying, the governor has really prioritized trying to reopen schools. Our school is a charter school. And we, um, you know, the, the school board and the principal are looking at potentially trying to reopen um, late March, early April, because we're on a trimester system and they've been making decisions trimester by trimester. And um, so I was kind of paying attention to some of the protests that were happening and following it on Twitter and hearing about the particularly noxious chemicals that were being used in the past several weeks, um, including, you know, there's some speculation that they use HC gas, which is sounds, I don't know that much about it, but it sounds very dangerous. At least you might have more thoughts as a, as a pediatrician, but, um, you know, the combination of those two things of hearing about the, the really horrible chemicals that are being used right now. And, you know, I've seen, a, I had seen accounts about spent munitions and tear gas canisters and stuff littering our playground. And then contrasting that with thinking about like, okay, well, we're actually moving towards going back to school. Is this going to be safe? And so, um, you know, really starting to raise the alarm. We, we um, have been taking some steps to try to assess what the risk is and what the actual situation on the ground is. So the school has um, connected with some scientists um, and taking soil samples and collecting the spent munitions and TRS canisters and all of that from the play yard to try to both clean up the stuff that's there and to assess what may have been released um, in the school. Um, and our principal, Amanda McAdoo, um, wrote a letter to ICE, basically demanding that they stop using tear gas at this location and other chemical munitions, and that they help us understand what chemicals have been used, what their health impacts may be, may be what the contamination is at our school helping us with all of this testing, and that they, uh, you know, remediate our school so that it is safe for children again. Um, we I've been I've been starting to organize parents at the school to help um, basically mount a campaign to, to try to support those goals of getting ice to stop using tear gas and chemical munitions um, at our at that location and getting them to help us clean up and um, We've been in touch with a lot of elected officials. Lisa has just jumped right in on this and I'm so grateful for her leadership in um, you know, as a pediatrician and a legislator, um, just really trying to look at what our options are um, and what we may be able to do to help try to address the situation. Um, so I know Lisa is considering the possibility of legislation and also coordinating with Representative Janelle Bynum, whose um, subcommittee on equitable policing is looking at a bill on um, trying to further restrict the use of tear gas by uh, local law enforcement, um, which would not stop ICE from using it because they're not local law enforcement, but um, looking at, you know, how to coordinate with existing efforts already going on around the use of tear gas in Portland and in the state. Um, so I'm really grateful to Lisa um, and we've been kind of tag teaming this and sharing lots of messages and resources with each other. Um, I've done a lot to try to reach out to elected officials, um, you know, federal, state, local. Um, and so our federal delegation is very supportive, our, our members of Congress and 
um, the two senators and then Representative Blumenauer, whose district the school is in, is Representative Bonamici, who has many constituents that attend the school, like myself, my kids, um, sent a joint letter to the secretary of DHS asking him to respond to the letter from our principal. So that's really helpful because I know a lot of times, you know, a little school principal sends a letter, it's easy to ignore, but if you have two senators and two congressmen or, or members of Congress, um, representatives writing a letter saying, pay attention to this and respond to it, that helps a lot. So I'm really grateful to our congressional delegation for supporting us in that way. Um, I've been in communication with a lot of other local elected offices from, you know, county commissioners, uh, uh, city of Portland, uh, council member commissioners, whichever, I don't know, I might get mixed up about what to call them. But anyways, um, state DEQ, I've been in touch with a lot of folks. And the next step for us in this work is that we, we've been doing a lot of that groundwork of reaching out to elected officials and raising the concern. And our next step is that we're going to be really taking this more public and, um, you know, working on getting an action alert out with a whole lot of folks that we would like, you know, those same spectrum of elected officials and state agencies and local agencies asking folks to make calls and send emails just to make it clear that there's, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a huge uh, support for the idea that kids should not be exposed to these uh, toxic chemicals and that, you know, tear gas and, and the like are banned in warfare. So I don't understand why they're being used as a first line of defense by our local law enforcement and by federal officers in our city um, without any regard for not just, I mean, I don't think they should be using them on at all on the people who are present, but they're not even taking any consideration into the collateral effects when these types of chemicals are left in the environment. And, you know, ours is, our school is a very egregious example of that where, um, you know, it's a playground littered with tear gas canisters and pepper balls and exploded munitions and chemical residues. And that's just a huge stark example of how terrible this is. But the exposure that we're seeing to citizens all over Portland, or I mean, people all over Portland is just um, terrible. So uh, I don't think it's an issue restricted to our school. Um, and um, so that's, we're gonna be um, launching social media sites that um, I'll work with Lisa and ask her to share in a future newsletter so that folks can follow us and stay up to date on how to continue this pressure to make sure that we're um, staying on top of the issue and pressuring ICE to um, stop using these dangerous chemicals. Um, just two more quick things, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so really quickly, um, one thing I wanted to say that I should have said at the outset is just that, you know, we're looking at an issue where we're seeing some real um, dangerous and abusive behavior by ICE uh, towards the people in the vicinity and the people that are present at these protests. But I, I always want to be considering this in the context of the fact that we know ICE is an abusive agency and that what we're seeing at our school um, doesn't even begin to compare to the abuses that they are inflicting on immigrant and refugee families in America. And so, um, you know, I think that we have to fight the abuses from ICE at every level. And I want to make sure that the outpouring of support that I expect that we'll get for our school is helping be in solidarity with folks that are fighting all the other abuses against ICE and not distracting from it. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to quickly mention was um, that there, I also through this work have gotten connected with some folks that already have a lawsuit in the in in progress against um, the federal government against use of their tear gas and chemical munitions in Portland. Um, the lawsuit um, is through the ACLU and they're representing a number of environmental groups, um, which I can quickly read the list. Um, but I was, I am a member of 350 PDX, which is one of the environmental groups. So I provided a declaration in the case of the impacts that the use of tear gas in Portland has had on me and my family, because they're kind of at a stage in the um, lawsuit where they're having to show that they have standing, which is a legal term for showing that the groups that are suing are actually directly impacted. So as a member, having this direct impact on my family that I can demonstrate um, is helpful. If anyone... Um, and and Kate, I'm going to be sending out a follow-up to this town hall and posting it. So I, I can, include, you know, I'll include that information. Yeah. So, so if folks are a member of any of those groups and feel that you have been directly impacted by 
the use of tear gas and chemical munitions, either as someone who's attended a protest and been tear gas, which I also have been, and I included that in my declaration, or if you are in the South Waterfront community and it's impacted you directly, um, they are looking to connect with you. They have a filing next week, so they really need to hear from people as soon as possible. And that, I think, did I forget anything, Lisa, on this? No, I think, I think you got it. I mean, I think what we just keep hearing is that it's very hard for city, county, or state to um, have any jurisdiction to what the federal agents do. But it just is um, just kind of horrifying. I've been calling it the poisoned playground. I mean, it's just like kind of unbelievable. And the other thing is I was, you know, reading into this and trying to learn more about tear gas. And I started, tear gas is actually a powder. It's like a propelled powder. And I was thinking about, you know, powder particles. I'm like, oh my God, it's like learning about COVID droplets all over again. So the, uh, the, uh, the droplet and aerosol scientists are, um, are, you know, our heroes right now, who, who knew, but uh, thank you, Kate, so much, both for your work and for giving us an update. And I will for sure be keeping people in the loop. This is really important. And, and I think that's a good acknowledgement that um, what your school is suffering is, is um, just one of many things that ICE is doing egregiously uh, to, to people in, in the US. So I see some hands up here. We'll just go straight to Q&A. One thing I was going to maybe talk about today, and we're just running out of time, but I'm happy to do it a different time. But how do you, um, Kate and, uh, and um, Amanda McAdoo, the principal testified in uh, Representative Bynum's committee this week, um, the subcommittee, Judiciary Subcommittee on Equitable Policing, I think is what it's called, about the tear gas ban. Um, and um, that's certainly, I'll have a separate session or, or include in my newsletter how to testify. It's at, at easier than ever. You can do it from your couch as opposed to coming down to Salem. Um, and it's really, really important. Um, Nancy, you have a question. You can unmute yourself and ask your question, please. And I'll go. My, my question, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My question is about support for the, um, the three bills that are in the legislature. And now I don't have them in front of me because I have this in front of me on my computer instead. But the ones that um, we're going to increase electrification and provide support for rate payers, low income rate payers. Um, there's one other that now I've completely lost, but um, and I'm, I was just wondering what your sense of how those are going is and, and what you can tell us about their progress. I will be really honest, I don't know, but I'm happy to look into those and get back to you. It's, um, it is, it's been, uh, it's been quite a learning curve of figuring out how to track bills. Um, and I don't know those particular bills. So I apologize. Well, I can send you the numbers and then I'll yeah. use you. I apologize for not having them, but my screen only does one thing at a time. No, so I know. And you know what? I have to get better at re like remembering which bill is which number. Um, but, uh, but yeah, Nancy, if you could email that to me and I'm happy. I, to and, and yeah, um, there, you know, the, I know that there's a, um, there's an intention to try and and not focus on environmental aspects as much as support for rural communities and underserved neighborhoods, which is, I think, a really good thing to do. And, and at the same time, those bills would be really helpful to the environment and they would- Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Know, and, and yeah, and I think your, 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 the discussion about helping rate payers, I mean, I, you know, I'm on the House Committee on Water, and our first, our first hearing, uh, informational hearing, was about um, providing support for families who couldn't pay their water bill and families whose septic tanks had broken and needed replacement, which is a very, you know, and I'm like, wow, everything comes down to human services, even House Committee on Water. But obviously, people are really struggling right now. We got to yeah. figure out how to help them. So thank you. Oh, I know. The third one is, is I think about um, helping. Um, weatherize and protect houses, yeah. especially in wildfire areas where yeah. you know, people are breathing smoke. Yeah, is, that's the one I've heard the most about. Um, and I, I think there's definitely a commitment on the Democrats part to move things forward, but I'm happy to dig a little deeper than that. Great. Well, I will send you the numbers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Um, Mark. Thank you, Dr. Lisa. I, uh, nice first of all, just, I just wanted to say, uh, first of all, thank you to uh, Kate as a member of the a resident of the South Waterfront. Right. I uh, really appreciate your efforts down and um, what you're doing. 
And I wanted to just share a little more background so that people really understand the situation there. Um, that building was, you know, never, um, there was no community in input or any type of process when that building was established there. Uh, they came in and did it. And I think for a long time, we didn't even know what it was probably from the first year. Um, I think at the time, Mayor um, Adams had made an objection and it was his three months before the end of his term and then Charlie Hells never said a word. So it became entrenched. After that, they did more development in South Waterfront and they built affordable housing kitty corner from the ICE facility. And this is affordable housing for our veterans. Um, they suffer the effects of the gas. The, the people living in that um, part of the neighborhood get the gas inside of their apartments. They have to put uh, towels and stuff up around their windows. And I don't think it's any coincidence that that's where the affordable housing was located. Um, I would like to just say as a long-term goal, we should um, fix the problem by closing that facility. And I wonder why we're, we have a border detention facility in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we're not really near any borders. Um, apparently the Homeland Security law allows for detention facilities within 100 miles of the coast. So it's legal, um, but I would like to see uh, what can we do to, to actually get that thing shut down as a long-term goal. And then I, I think, am. I think well, yeah, thank you, Mark. I think that's, yeah. I mean, I think that's a great um, concept. I know Kate and I've even talked about if, you know, um, buildings like this, buildings should be, should, if we can keep them away from residential areas or certainly schools, but that's, I think you're right. That's kind of a bigger picture goal. And um, thank keep you. Them, keep them out of Portland, Oregon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Howard Shapiro. I've, I've been down there to demonstration and they do throw that stuff around. I'm wondering if you have taken, uh, Kate, taken advantage of signage. Have the kids make signs. We're not the enemy, ICE. Don't gas us. Yeah, we have, we're, our school's kind of well known for having a bunch of Black Lives Matter signs up on our fence. And um, we, I have been talking to the principal about um, also having the kids make some signs, not necessarily focused on our school, but um, I think it would be good if we're going to be getting more attention to have some signs maybe highlighting um, that we recognize immigrants are an integral part of our community and things along the, those lines. So we're, we're, we're contemplating how, what we're going to do and how we're going to um, be using the fence for going forward. And I was thinking about that. Veterans made signs and put them in their windows. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. We're that... not your enemy. We're veterans. Stop well, they, yeah. Us. yeah. They might yeah. be sensitive to that. Mm. And the other issue about the building with the veterans is, um, you know, I've heard it's also not just the direct impacts of the gas, but that a lot of the veterans, you know, obviously have PTSD and being exposed to the kind of militarization that the way ICE has been responding to these protests is like really, really difficult for them. So I, mm -hmm. I, I definitely really agree with Mark that it would be great to see that building closed down and not there anymore. Yeah, even when they just use the flashbangs, that's probably not yeah. good right for the vets. Yeah, can you imagine? Oh my gosh, yeah, it's so, it's like, it's almost like you can't make this stuff up. Yeah. I was thinking about that poster that was really popular when I was a kid, like war is not healthy for children and other living beings or things or whatever with flowers. Like it's like, you know, poison is not, anyway, you, I'm sure Kate, Kate's on it. Kate and her kids are on it. Um, you guys, I should show a picture of Kate with, she had a bag of like, She'd bring a bag with like 25 signs to every demonstration. We just rifle through them and pick our favorite and then put it back in the bag. Anyway, so I have no doubt. Um, thanks, thanks, Alice. I've seen that. Um, Bill, Bill Van Henry. There, I think I am un, uh, unmuted. You are. Thank you for having town halls. Thanks uh, for I being here. One of the few ways that um, the community in general uh, can hear from representatives. And indeed, uh, if we do our part and show up, 
uh, you can get the feeling that you are getting a channel open to your community. Thank you. I'm not sure how to encourage more attendance at these things. I do think that 10 o'clock on the hour is personally easier for me than 1030, just because to do things Saturday morning, ten, things tend to be scheduled on the hour and last about an hour in length. So 1030 takes up two time blocks. Given okay, that. Thank, thank, thanks for that. I'm happy to, I'm happy to start at 10. Why it was at 10.30, but that would be a, a, an item to ask you to consider. And then about uh, the legislative activity, I am especially interested in our uh, passing some legislation that makes good on the constitutional amendment we passed in November that makes it finally legal for us to directly regulate campaign contributions. And wonder if you have some regulations in mind already that you hope to introduce. Um, thank you for that. Oh my gosh, could not come too soon. I would have liked if it were in place two years ago. But um, I know that um, Representative Dan Rayfield is kind of taking the lead on this topic and is an expert, but it's, it's really about limiting uh, campaign contributions, I think is, is really where we need to go. There's, you know, as you guys know, Oregon's one of the few states where there's no limit whatsoever in individual or corporate or special interest uh, contributions to a campaign. The 2020 campaign was um, both the primary and the general was pretty rife with um, quite a bit of money being poured in. So um, I think the main thing is, is contribution limits as well as um, what I would call truth in advertising, making really clear when there are campaign ads uh, who is um, who is literally bankrolling those ads? Does that do those sound like good ideas to you, Bill? They do, but a follow-up uh, question would be: uh, just you can't commit yourself to it because you haven't studied it this week. But um, considering your re recollection of recently uh, running a campaign as a new person to the realm. Um, for uh, an as it was an empty seat, it cost a certain amount of money. Do you have in mind an amount of money at which we should regulate and there would, we should consider a maximum and uh, you'd still have plenty of money to do a campaign? That's a great question. I don't have a number to put to that. I think that, I think that's a really interesting idea that I hadn't thought about. I mean, we're certainly talking a lot about individual and corporate and special interest contributions being um, limited, but, you know, then there's the, the bucket you have to draw from, you know, depending on if you're an incumbent or not, but uh, interesting point, Bill, I will certainly think about that. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Yes. Um, Henry, Henry, for those of you who don't know, know Henry Wessinger, he's the uh, founder and executive director of State of Safety, which is a um, uh, grassroots um, gun violence prevention group uh, really focused on, on bills that will save lives from gun violence. And you can add to that um, quick bio, Henry. Oh, thanks, Lisa. Um, I just wanted to add that the fact that the our safe storage bill, which is House Bill 2510 this year um, is going, was referred to the House um, Committee on Healthcare, um, was really a statement by party, by, by the Democratic leadership in the House. And that committee is chaired by Representative Rachel Pruzak, who was the co sponsor of our bill last year and is one of the four co sponsors of the bill this year, along with yourself and Representative Solomon for the second year in a row and Senator Burdick. So uh, that's, that was really very good news and it gets us out of uh, gun violence as a political issue and puts it into the public health sphere. The second thing is uh, we have preliminary indications that we're gonna have a hearing on March 9th in the healthcare oh. committee with a work session on the 11th. And um, I'll make certain that um, as soon as we've gotten word from the lobbyists that um, I get make certain that you know that so you can include that in your um, 
emails out to the constituents. So anyway, and it's great seeing you uh, in the saddle representative. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it's uh, really a, an honor and a thrill to be here. Um, I think we're just about out of time today. Not any, any last burning question. I will just say um, I'm really grateful to my engaged constituency and any, obviously anyone can come to these. You don't have to be a constituent. I take very seriously that I am, um, that I am, you know, here to make life better for every single Oregonian, not just my constituents, although you guys are, you guys are my priority. Um, but uh yeah, really, really grateful to see you all here. Reach out anytime. Um, you know, Joe and my other staff member, Maida, and I are, you know, we, we read every email. We respond to every email, maybe not always right away. We want to be thoughtful in our responses. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a lot of work we need to accomplish this session. And I, I really, really welcome and I really need your input. So, um, Thank you all so much. My plan is to do once a month constituent coffees in the mornings and I'm happy to move times around. Um, and then we'll be doing um, on the other two weeks uh, time frame doing um, town hall. So two weeks from tomorrow will be my town hall at 5.30 PM. And if there's something, a topic you would like for me to delve into in town halls um, or constituent coffees, don't hesitate to reach out on that. But I'm grateful for you all. Have a good rest of your day and, and weekend. And um, let's, I, I think we can take a few minutes and, and feel comfortable that we are starting to see a light at the end of this COVID tunnel. We're, we're just about at the year mark. It's hard to believe. If someone would have told me a year ago it was going to be over a year, I would have not believed it. <laughs> it makes sense that it has been, of course, if you think about science and transmission and everything we've learned. I was thinking about a year ago. Uh, in March, they closed down all the cross country ski parks. And I'm gonna go cross country skiing later today. Um, and because we just understand better, right? We didn't understand a year ago what it meant to cross country ski with other people in the vicinity. Now we know that masks work. Now we know that outdoor transmission is pretty minimal. And then as I, when I'm cross country skiing, I'm like, I'm vaccinated, <laughs> which I know is maybe not, um, the kindest thing to be said. like, I don't mean to be rubbing that in, but like, I'm not at risk to you, which we know it may not be true, but I always have my mask on. But anyway, it's uh, so great to see you all. Thanks for all you're doing to keep transmission rates low. I'm really proud of our state right now. Um, and uh, we'll obviously be watching the school, uh, the school roll out quickly. Hey, Paul, hi, <laughs> nice to see you guys. I owe you, I I'm, I'm, haven't forgotten about you, Paul. I owe you I'm this weekend. <laughs> Um, but anyway, thank you all so much. Reach out for anything. I'll keep people um, apprised of what's happening with the Cottonwood School and um, gun violence prevention bills and all that whatnot. But uh, so great to see you guys. I can't wait till we can start doing these in person. Maybe a while, but um, but this is a nice alternative. You can just go back to your go back to your Saturday morning. So uh, thanks so much. Have a great day. Thanks, thanks, Joe. Thank Take you. Care.